Okay, welcome everybody and um, looking forward to this session. Hopefully you can get something out of it. So the topic is adapting cheese recipes to meet production capabilities for the artists and cheesemakers. Bit of a mouthful. But this topic has really come about from a lot of the questions I get asked and it could be from startup companies that are having trouble with recipes or sometimes someone's bought recipes off people or they're starting to work for somebody and don't understand how to work with their recipes. So it really has come from lots of questions. So today's session is more focusing on the small and micro manufacturers. Um, it's more centered about really small producers, but it does work with larger producers as well. Um, it's centered around thinking about the basics. So I will cover a lot of the basics, but this could be like an intro topic. So if you come up with something later for another webinar that you'd like to expand on anything, please tell Jenny. So the areas to consider when we're looking at recipes and manufacturing are people, ingredients, process and equipment. And if you keep all those things in mind, it just helps when you're nutting out your recipes. It's very important, even the equipment. With people, it is a little bit difficult. A lot of people say to me, you know, how do I employ the right person for the right task? And at the moment, it is difficult. Cheesemakers are getting poached. I get phone calls at least weekly for somebody wanting a cheesemaker. And it is really hard. So the best thing I'd say, if somebody has been trained, it doesn't matter whether it's any sort of certificate three in food processing or in a degree program in food science or a diploma in food science, at least you know they would understand HACCP, food safety, procedures. So it's, they're a little bit then easier to train in your task of cheese making. It's really important to ensure that they do have the company's best interest at heart and don't bring in bad habits because we are looking at a high risk product and people need to understand that. And how to follow the procedures that are your procedures I would also encourage training, and it doesn't matter whether it's formal or just in-house training. And sharing knowledge for me is very important. The problem a lot of the times I see, you've got your cheese makers that don't teach the juniors coming up or the actual processes, what do the recipes mean? What does it mean when you weigh out culture? Does it really matter if you put in too much rennet and they just don't tell anybody? So share the knowledge and encourage them to understand everything actually in the process. When we're talking ingredients, um, luckily cheese is very simple and it's all got lovely fresh ingredients. We're talking milk, calcium chloride, cultures, rennet, salt and annatto. Sometimes people do put in other um, inclusions like uh, herbs and spices, um, but generally that's the main ingredients you use in cheese making. As far as the process goes, again, most cheese that you make, the process is very, very similar. There's just a few different little angles to take to change the style of cheese you're making. So when we're talking pasteurization, so it's either high temperature um, short time or low temperature long time. So it's either continuous flow or batch pasteurization. Most small producers I know are all batch pasteurization. Again, addition of calcium chloride, if you need to add it. If you've got fresh milk on farm, you would know when your calcium is low and when to add it. Or um, if you have to store your milk for any length of time, you, you would add it. So again, you don't have to add it every time. Addition of cultures for acidification. How do you choose the cultures? How do you choose the mould ripening cultures? Addition of rennet for coagulation. Know the quantity you need. Cutting the curd. How are you going to cut the curd? Is it manual or is it um, by hand? Then two highlighted areas I've got here is cooking the curd if applicable and washing the curd if applicable. Now, this is in specific cheeses. A lot of people seem to get them mixed up a little bit. You know, cooking the curd is bringing it up to temperature and washing the curd, you're actually adding water and taking out some whey or just adding water. So the flavour profile and the texture does change considerably. So you need to have an understanding of that and how much washing you actually do. Otherwise, the cheese itself will get very pasty. So that's just something to watch out for is the texture of getting too pasty because that then brings on bitterness. Cheddaring is very specific to making Stilton or cheddar. So it's the cheddaring or the milling process. 
about your weighing off or draining, like have you got the right tables where you're weighing off, how long are you going to weigh off for, where are you going to drain, hooping, again, is it hand hooping, are you gravity feeding down to your hoops, salting and brining, and then, of course, ageing, that's another science on its own. It probably really is a topic. Um, it's probably best to um, have the right rooms for the right cheeses. I find most people make five different cheeses, try to squeeze them all in the one condition. It doesn't quite work. And then distribution, knowing who you're going to sell to and make sure you follow that cold chain so that your product does get to your distributor in its best condition. When we're looking at uh, equipment, a lot of people say to me, where do I buy equipment? What do I buy? I can't answer that. So it really is doing the research and talking to other cheesemakers. But most small processors I know would always buy a batch pasteurizer so that they've got their vat, they pasteurize in the vat, they make cheese in the vat. Or if it's continuous flow, it'll get pumped, the milk will get pumped into a large vat and then it's made from there. With your equipment, you really need to consider um, shape and size of the vat, like how much milk are you going to process? What's your capabilities? Um, the grade of the stainless steel really is important. Buy it once, buy it properly is probably my best recommendation there. And again, the ageing room capabilities. What are you going to make? Think about that first and then work on from that. So people that say to me, Oh, I might make a balloon, a tom, maybe a cheddar. Oh, I'll do some white mould, maybe a bit of feta as I can sell that quickly. You really have to think about, well, oh, what's the best rooms? What's the best conditions? What packaging do I need? So you really do have to think about it. So I'm more in favour of think of one style of cheese and so your conditions and your hoops and your vat suit that style of cheese and then maybe grow from there. What do you intend to make? As I've just said, that's fundamentally important. And again, with hoops, a lot of people think, oh, oh, I've got hoops. I'll just use the same hoop for everything. They don't drain the same, and that can be detrimental to your cheese. And again, about what draining area do you need? You need your cheeses to drain for one day, two days, and it makes a difference if you're using your make room as your draining room as well when you're starting to make cheese in there again the next day. And again, about buying a press, what sort of press do you need? I fundamentally made a mistake. Um, I didn't do enough research. I had a press, it broke down. I bought another press, had it made, didn't quite have it made the way I should have. It sort of, I was hoping to be able to put in different size hoops. I didn't really think about it well enough. And it's not pressing my cheeses as well. So I have to make sure that I use the same size hoops every time. And that was just a hard lesson to learn. But um, it's when you just don't think about the actual process, um, you do fund fundamentally make those little mistakes. Power source should be pretty basic, but I do find that a lot of people don't understand about maybe saving power, saving money. What does it cost to run your power? How much um, hot water do I need? Do I have solar power? I had um, one company ring me and say, oh, I didn't even think about it, but they bought a vat that was three-phase power and they didn't have three-phase power. So then you have to have adapters or have it brought up and it's very, very costly and it probably just didn't fit into your plan of when you did your projection for building your factory. So really thinking about all the power you need in the sources is really, really important. This is just a glossary of terms that will help later on as I'm talking about things, you can go back and look at this. It's more for your benefit for later. So I'm not gonna read through them. So just some um, basic sort of glossaries there for you. Now, again, now understanding your ingredients, not forgetting that milk is actually your best ingredient and fresh is best, because that's what we fundamentally start with is milk. But one of the most important additions is the cultures. I get asked a lot about cultures. How do I use my cultures? How do I work out the recipe? How do I know how much to put in? I find that I'm asked questions that sometimes I think, oh, you've been in production for a long time. How did you not know this? And it really is you don't know what you don't know. So I get asking questions to people, reading spec sheets, and I'll go through that in a little while. Um, and again, most of what I'm going to go through coming up in the next slides is because people have asked me these questions um, and haven't been able to work with recipes or adapt recipes 
or when they've changed environment, the recipes haven't worked the same. And if they've wanted to make changes and they undertake trials and are understanding why the trials didn't work. As mentioned before, it's important to start with uh, the best raw ingredient, which is the milk. Uh, milk really should be less than 48 hours old, which is, you know, great if you've got milk nearby and on a farm. It just depends. Sometimes you're buying small amounts of milk and people want to store it in their silo and have it for a little while and build up a, a good quantity to process. But by storing it, then you're going to have some complications. So you should store it below four degrees prior to pasteurisation. What happens if you store it for too long, your calcium bonds in the milk will break down and go into solution, which makes your proteins a little bit weaker. So you have a little bit of a softer set and you could lose some yield. So it's best not to store your milk for too long. You, have a, you want to have low somatic cell counts because high somatic cell counts will lead to rancidity. You want to make sure you're antibiotic free. And if you can from the farmer find out what your fat and protein ratio is, it's really good to keep a track of that. So seasonally, you'll be able to track how you, you can tweak your recipe to fit that fat and protein ratio where your fat drops off or builds up. The role and functions of your starter cultures. This is really, really important and there's some basic science in, I'm keeping it very, very basic, but fundamentally a starter culture. So you've got your glycolysis, which is really breakdown of sugars. So it converts your lactose to lactic acid. The proteolysis is basically breakdown of protein. So you've got a long protein chain and it breaks it right down to your amino acids. And lipolysis is your breakdown of fats into keto acids, ketones and esters. And those ketones and esters are what brings in the flavours. So proteolysis will give you more um, textural and flavour, but mainly it'll break down textures. And your lipolysis is more on giving you the flavour profile. Your key characteristics of cultures, and I've mentioned that into the glossary, is your undefined starter cultures and your defined starter cultures. But what I want to talk a little bit about are your homo-fermentative cultures, which produce more than 80% lactic acid, and your hetero-fermentative cultures, which produce um, the less than 80%. Cultures have specific roles in cheese making. We all know that it's the cultures that produce acid and converting the lactose into lactic acid. A lot more happens in the background there, but that's it in a nutshell. During ripening, when the cultures lies or break down cells and release enzymes, these enzymes break down protein and fat, resulting in textural and flavour development. So while we're talking about breaking down cells, again, if you're keeping your milk cold for too long and you've got your calcium breaking down, what also happens is you can have your bacteria or those cold-loving bacteria growing in your milk which is fine, those psychotrophs, they'll grow and they'll release enzymes and they might release some off flavours. It doesn't really hurt your milk in the sense from a food safety point of view because when you pasteurise it, you will kill everything off. But those off flavours that have come through from the enzymes, they're there to stay. So the older the milk, the more chance you've got of some off flavours drifting into your cheese making. Then also we've got our lovely adjunct cultures, which just give a bit of a boost of flavour and can shorten your ripening time. Now, this is just a nice little bacterial graph. I'm just going to get me a little stick here, my little lace pointer. If you have a look here, this is where in the beginning you've, you're adding your cultures and you're putting, pitching them into the milk and they need chance to grow. So they're waking up at this point. So that lag phase is the waking up process. Now this is for the cultures we pitch into milk, but don't forget it could also be if we've had a cross-contamination of any sort and you've got an E. coli or coliforms in there, this is the opportunity while everything is waking up that they will grow as well. So that's why I always like to mention good hygiene practices, good manufacturing practices. But as far as pitching in our cultures, this is the opportunity that one hour before we put our rennet in, they're sort of waking up. And then you've got that exponential growth here where the numbers grow extremely large and you've got that sort of breakdown of your sugars. From there, sort of the nutrient source is starting to slow down. So we've got our nice little stationary phase where you've got sort of no more real growth into um, the cultures in that medium. And then you've got the decline 
So their death rate of your culture sort of running out of the food source and so they die off unless you pitch them into something new. So it's just, this is something that most people know, but I just wanted you to see the actual um, um, bacterial growth phase. And I'm just gonna get rid of my little stick there again. Oops, sorry. So when we're talking the psychotroph um, bacteria, you've got, you know, this cold loving bacteria that said can give you the off flavours in the milk. So they're sort of between that less than seven degrees and 20 degrees. We don't actually use them in cheese making, but we want to make sure that we don't have problems in cheese making from them. So again, don't store your milk um, over time. And then you've got your thermodurics at the bottom, which are, are, they love over 70 degrees. They're very hot. So again, we don't use them in cheese making. But what I've highlighted are your mesophilic cultures and your thermophilic cultures. So your mesophiles love that middle temperature. So it does say technically between 15 and 45 degrees. And this is where I find there's a little bit of an issue when cheese making is uh, trying to push that boundary. So 15 degrees is a bit cool. If you're um, acidifying overnight to make um, a lactic curd, so you would be maybe gone between 17 and 22. But for your general cheese making, you probably should go 30 to 34. I find most people think, oh, I just want to go a bit faster. I'm going to pitch in at 40, 42. It's still under 45. They'll still live. Well, they're sort of dying off actually at that point. They're getting too hot and they don't like it. They won't like the environment. So you have to be really careful when you're thinking about developing recipes and you're using a mesophilic culture to actually really think about that pitching. So between 30 and 34, 32 is really good. And again, it depends on your environment. Um, myself and the cheese factory here at TAFE in the middle of winter, it's really, really cold. And I got my bassines, I have washed them and sanitized them. They're very cold. And as I pitch the milk in, I know I drop two degrees immediately. So if I want a 32 degrees uh, temperature to pitch my cultures in, I go in at 34 or 35 maybe, knowing I'll drop two to three degrees. That's okay. Once I put my cultures in, I know I'm sitting at 32. And you have to work with the environment. If you've got the sort of um, vat or bassines that you're making cultures in that you can't warm up after, you need to know whether it's going to drop too cold and you need to go in a little bit warmer. But again, putting in at 40, 42 for mesophile really is a little bit too warm. Your thermophilic cultures, what are used in many, many cheeses, again, they can go right up to 60 degrees, but that is getting a little bit too hot. So you start off at about that 37, and the highest I know of your sort of granas, the Italian cheeses, Emmentals, they're sort of cooked to about 55, and that's probably as high as I'd push that one as well. Okay, now just a little bit about mesophilic cultures and just talking about the homo-fermentative and the hetero-fermentative. Now, with most cultures, we know that they metabolise the lactose, so it consumes the lactose, ferments the lactose, and it gives you lactic acid as the byproduct for acidification. So we are tracking a drop in pH. So we're looking at a Lactococcus lactus lactus and a Lactococcus lactus cremoris. So these are defined blends of pure strains. So they do not ferment the citrate there, so it doesn't produce a gas. So just remembering that homo-fermentative gives you lactic acid, is not a gas producer. Your heterofermentative, same thing, converts the lactose, gives you lactic acid, but the other byproduct it gives you is ethanol, acetic acid, and it does give you some CO2. So that's the byproduct. So as well as acidification with your heterofermentative, you will get a little bit of gas production. So sometimes people go, oh, I've got all these bubbles in my cheese, you know, I've got coliforms, and I think, well, maybe look at what culture you're using. If you've got a little bit of a gas producer, that's what it probably is, and not to panic that you've infected um, your cheese. Just knowing the culture you've used is a gas producer. Not gas producer as a proponic, as if you're making um, a Yale's burger or a Mars Dam or something, not big fat eyes, but nice little small shiny eyes. And, and it pops up now and again, sometimes they're like little pinholes. So just, yeah, be wary that that's what it's there. A lot of people haven't got an understanding of homo-fermentative and hetero-fermentative. Just remember gas producer, non-gas producer. And the heterofermentative is uh, more the diacetylactis or the leuconostoc species. And just remember, diacetylactis gives you those nice buttery notes. 
Now, with firmophilic cultures, they're mainly used in your um, hard Italian cheeses, your mozzarellas, emmentals, because they love um, sort of high temperatures. So we're talking a streptococcus thermophilus here and your lactobacillus bulgaricus and helveticus. So in addition to lactic acid, your lactic acid cultures produce acetaldehyde and other flavour components, so they give you more flavour, and they also promote some proteolysis during ripening. So, and they do give it a little bit more stability. Ooh, there it goes. Now, just a um, nice little graph here that shows you what lactose does. And this is handy to know for when you're doing your sort of stabilised versus an unstabilised um, brie or camembert. And this actually could be a, a topic on its own is soft cheese and, and ripening soft cheeses. So your lactose converts to lactic acid and of course it causes the pH of the milk to drop and your acid increases. And as you can see by the diagram, that a mesophilic culture, um, or most mesophilic cultures, will uh, metabolise your galactose and glucose. So lactose is a, um, a monosaccharide and it splits into two sugars, galactose and glucose. And so your mesophilic cultures consumes both. So you're going to have more of a pH drop, whereas your thermophilic cultures will only metabolise the glucose. So you've still got some of that galactose there. So um, for a soft rub and choose is using, using a thermophilic culture, which is a more modern method of production for a longer shelf life cheese. The pH stays a little bit higher, above five. Um, it's got less sugar that's converted to the lactic acid. And this makes it more stable as the calcium's not as broken down as um, the mesophiles that break down both sugars. Now, when we talk about adjunct cultures, this is a, a nice little tricky one here. Um, I've had a few people ask me about adjunct cultures and I had one person ring me and say, oh, I've got trouble. I keep adding more of this culture. I'm not getting the acidity I want. An adjunct culture really is a flavour enhancer, a bit of a booster. Now, I'm not promoting any particular um, culture company here. I'm just using spec sheets I've got. So I'm not sort of promoting Daniska over Hanson's or vice versa um, or Sacco. So please forgive me if I've put up sheets that you're not familiar with or you are. I just need to sort of put something up to show you. So with um, the little telltale here that it's uh, an adjunct culture, because it's not very clear for somebody starting out and, and you're trying to work with recipes, but in the properties, it does say it's applied as a supplement culture. So it's a little bit of a, a telltale there. And also what I've circled is it's the dose rate. So if you look at your spec sheets and you can see a dose rate of as small as 0.1 to 0.3, it's an adjunct because normally you'd start at least three doses. So it's very, very small. So it's just something that you add as a flavour and texture enhancer. And you usually will do it in combination with another culture, something like the TA series or the TCC. So it is a bit of a booster. You can put this in your cheddar cultures to give your cheddar a more of a boost and a, and a boost flavour and, and can make it age a little bit quicker. So it's just getting used to the fact that you've got adjunct cultures, but you do not use them as acidifiers. When we're just looking, and I encourage everybody to look at spec sheets. I find that most of the people I talk to have never even looked at a spec sheet. They just follow the recipe that's been in their factory for years. And every now and again, they morph a little bit as people have changed them. And I think it's understanding how they've changed slightly. So I've just picked a culture here of an MM100. Now, the culture companies have done all the homework for you. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. They are telling you you can make soft cheese with it, butter, fresh cheese, semi-hard cheese, blue, and it goes on. So you look at these or you ring up your culture company and you say, look, I need something to make a brie, and they would make the recommendations. They give you the dose rates. So if it says 6.25 doses for 100 litres, that's what they're telling you. So don't go and put in 10 because you want the day to go a bit quicker. That will create its own problems. Um, and if you're looking at the composition, it's got lactose and cremorus and diacetylactis. Now, that diacetylactis will give you those nice buttery notes. So that's why those cheeses have been recommended. Then if looking at a different one, 
it, it's an, another it's an MA series 4001. And again, if you're looking at what the company has suggested, they're saying soft cheese, semi-hard, quark, sour cream. Okay, so cheeses fit in there that you might want to make. It tells you in the properties. It is heterofermentative. So you know it's going to be a little bit of a gas producer. And it's got the diacetylactase, so it's buttery, but it's also got a strep in there, so a thermophilus. Okay, so it's a little bit different than the other one. Not much, but a little bit. So why choose one over the other? So the MA4001 with a strep will give you a little bit more acidification power in your vat, whereas a mesophilic blend is quite a slower process. So it depends on what you're making and what sort of um, you're looking for in the day. And the cheese will also have a little bit more stability for shelf life if it's got the strep in there. Now we're looking at another culture and it's an RA21 and I chose this one in particularly because it is very specific to cheddar and some other semi-hard cheeses. Um, so again, it's got the lactis and the cremoris in there and it gives you a little bit of um, the thermophilus. Nothing in there that says diacetylactis. So it's very specific to cheddar um, because in the cheddar, you don't want the buttery notes because it takes away from the cheddar notes. So I've had people say, yeah, but I can make a cheddar out of MA. It's a semi-hard cheese, but the flavour profile will be quite different. If you want to develop something that's um, different, sure, you, you could do that and you can work with that. I went to a company in the Isle of Wight and very small producer, and he made a bit of a, a hybrid cheese and it was crossed between a continental and a cheddar. And I think it was more like continental cultures but cheddar process. Now he called it galley bagger. He gave it its own name. It was perfect. He's not trying to palm it off as a cheddar. And that's the best way to think when you're developing recipes is give them your own names, especially if you're tweaking it a little bit. There's nothing worse than trying something, saying it's a cheddar, but it doesn't really give you the cheddar notes. Then you might as well just call it something else. And be brave, make your own cheeses and give them your own names. It's uh, a lot classier and I think a lot more small Australian cheesemakers are going down that track. And it's really exciting to see out in the marketplace. Directions for use, this is a beauty. So manufacturing instructions, I don't know if I know too many cheesemakers that look at this. Now, it is really important. Like I said, the culture companies have done all the research, they've done all the work. So maybe look to see what they're saying. They're saying 30 to 60 minutes um, out of the fridge before you open them. So it is important for that if you're going to pitch in the whole packet. Now, with all of us little small cheesemakers, a packet of culture will last you a long time. So I decant it into a sterile container, as most people probably do, and then I weigh that out for the day. So you can keep that out at least 30 to 60 minutes before you're going to pitch it in. But again, in doing the, re oh, the repackaging, it is really important that you clean your packet before you open it, that you pour the entire packet into a, a sterile container. You mark the sterile container completely so you know exactly what went in there, the weight, the best before date. So you never actually lose track of that culture because it might last you three or four makes. These cultures were really designed to pitch the whole packet into milk um, but again, small cheesemakers, sometimes they just don't need that much. Um, and we do the best that we can. Um, if the product or, or the cultures, you can see that they're formed into a solid mass into um, a container, well, then they're, they're suggesting don't use it. So I would ensure that your correct dosage rate, know the weight of the cultures and do the math. So most of the packets now have the weights on them or you need to weigh them. Sterilise the bag. Even if you pitch the whole bag into your vat, make sure you've sterilised it. Pour the whole or all of the contents into a sterile container if that's what you do. Label it correctly. And don't forget that cultures are hydroscopic. That means they love water. They're very dry, so they will absorb moisture. So you need to avoid this. So don't just leave things open. I have seen plenty small cheese makers just have them open in the freezer, fold it over with a paper clip. That's an absolute no-no or even just in a Ziploc bag, doesn't really do it. 
Okay, this is just what one of the bags look like. And these days we're lucky enough that they're actually putting the weights on the bag. This actually says 89.1 grams for 250 units. So sometimes they don't put the weights on there, so you do have to weigh it. So you put your sterile container on the scales and you try and empty as much of the bag as you can, like completely empty if you can, and then you take that weight. So doing the maths, you're really just dividing it out. You've got 89.1 grams, you've got 250 units. So you know that one DCU is 0 0.36 grams because your recipes don't say or shouldn't say add four grams, add three grams. It should say add four units. And then you just times four by the 0.36. I've seen many people convert it all to grams and keep the grams in there. But what happens, these bags change weight. The DCU or the units, what that means is live units. So the weight of the bag actually does fluctuate, maybe not by much, but it does change. Now with cheese making, you need a controlled, consistent acidification, and it's quite critical. So having a nice slow acidification during the day, not a, a zip away fast one, because you need to get out the cheese factory quickly. You need to control it. Otherwise it's um, the cheese yield um, and the minimal end product and will have a lot of variability. Acidification vari variability is um, a major issue and can cause this consistency. So it will affect your uh, moisture, your salt content and your pH at the end of make. So you're not gonna have that consistency all the time. So we do strive for consistency um, as best as we can, which is really hard on small producers when they can't standardize the milk. Um, but you sort of do the best that you can with sort of controlling it and knowing how to change things. Uh, consistent acidification allows you to fine tune the process if, when you need to. Uh, factors that promote senoresis. So there's a few factors. So if you're trying to encourage it or know how to encourage it, if you increase your um, acid starter, that will give you more senoresis. A shorter setting time will have more weight expulsion increasing your scalding temperature, increase your rennet concentration, and again, decreasing your cut size. But if you cut smaller, you also will encourage more fat loss as well. And if you increase stirring, of course, you're going to lose more whey that way or senoresis encouraged. And then the opposite, sort of, if you want to reduce your senoresis, so again, if you've got an increase in fat, that actually, fat will retard senoresis. So you'll have less, it'll be more difficult to drive out the moisture from a high fat cheese. And that's why you don't make a high fat cheese Parmesan or Romano. You, you just don't do that. So if when you're trying to get your fat concentration right, um, you can use Pearson Square. And if you've got the opportunity of buying skim milk, you can reduce your fat that way. And if you can't, you sort of have to work with the milk as it is but you wouldn't just start thinking, well, I just might make a Parmesan with it. It won't be quite the same. You can have a longer setting time and cut bigger and your protein levels, um, if they increase, you'll have uh, reduced centimetres. Again, cutting the curd. I've just put these two pictures up so you can maybe see the one on the left. If you're cutting the curd and you can see that the whey is very yellow, very clear, and you've got a lot of the fines at the top, you've really overset it and overacidified it. So a little bit should be going, okay, a few alarm bells here. You should just have really a nice clean cut. Again, depending on what cheese you make, but you shouldn't have the, the whey so yellow and it shouldn't really have no fines at the top. Okay, manual cutting versus automatic cutting. So... Um, this is quite interesting. So cutting by hand, um, most people use harps or some sort of frame to cut the curd. And again, I can't stress good hygiene practices enough. And the wires need uh, not to be broken and to be as tight as possible because it does prevent drag. And um, because if you've got a lot of drag, you will lose a little bit of yield. Um, the cut size to the cheese doll, um, depending on what you're making. So one size doesn't fit all. I have been into a factory where they make 20 different cheeses and they've got one set of knives. And I just sit there and go, I don't even know how you do this. So um, you sort of make maybe one or two cheeses perfectly and then the others are okay. So that's when you sort of got to be really specific when you're purchasing your equipment. 
Cutting with mechanical knives, so this is on your vat, so you would have knives that you um, put at the top and they go round and round. So the curd is determined by the design of the vat and the agitators. So the speed of cutting and the duration of cutting is important and again, that the knives are sharp. Now, I had somebody ask me an interesting question just two days ago, asking me, can I take them for a visit to someone's factory so they can see the vat and the cut size because I was thinking of purchasing the same style vat. I said, well, I don't know if it matters whether you see the cut size. I'll take you up to see the vat. They said, no, 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 I want to see what size it cuts the curd. And I said, well, you're making a completely different cheese. So it really doesn't matter. So this is when you'd have to work with your recipe and your cut and you're not going to get it right the first time. So you have to work out how long do I leave the rotations going and how fast they go to get it right. And again, a little bit about trial and error and talk to the company that you buy your um, VAT from. And again, then write this as a written procedure so that anyone can go in then and know how many rotations and the speed to cut for a particular cheese you're making so that you don't have to keep playing the guessing game. And this will change seasonally and... Um, Seasonal variations will um, happen and so that you note them, so changing it a little bit between your summer milk and your winter milk. And after you cut, you do need to let the curd um, just heal for a little while, otherwise it smashes the curd up too quickly if you start stirring too quickly. Oh, and also just a, a note on sort of cutting size. Thanks, um, Kayla. Kayla's in my background nudging me here. Um, I went to a Gorgonzola factory. I worked in there for two weeks and I tried to do the recipe back in Australia. So they were showing me how to cut the curd and they cut it for their vat and it was quite big. And of course I came back and tried to cut it that big and didn't quite work. And the reason it wasn't working was, yes, it was cut big, but then it was going down a 20 centimetre outlet through a six centimetre pipe that went out onto a draining table. So by the time the curd came out of the uh, pump or the pipe, it was about a third of the size of what it was really cut. So again, I was just cutting and then hand stirring, hand hooping. So I just knew then the first time I worked, I thought, oh, that's not going to work. Um, and I just knew then, okay, cut a lot smaller. And I went back and looked at my pictures and I, I should have thought of that in the first instance, but I didn't. So when you're adapting someone's recipe and maybe haven't seen it, you really have to think about, was it done mechanically? Was it done in a big vat? Am I trying now to hand stir, hand cut and hand hoop? It's only the method, the recipe and the ingredients might be right, but that actual method will make a huge difference to your end product. And that's when you sort of have to really put your thinking cap on and just think about those small little things. And the cutting and the stirring is very, very important on the end product. Okay, main cheese defects. Now, lovely little picture there of a little wash rind cheese. I know, is there anything really wrong with it? I think if you look at anything like that, it might taste amazing. But I would say, okay, there's some gaps there. A lot of people go straight in and go, oh, my God, there's coliforms in that cheese. I'm not going to buy it. They're very irregular shapes. That's not a coliform. That's probably a hooping defect, a lot of trapped whey. And so you might sort of rethink how you do your hooping. You might have hooped the curd there a little bit too dry. So if I've got a cheese like that that I'm looking at before it goes to sale, doesn't mean you don't sell it, but you might go back, look at your recipes, look at your production and just start making some tweaks. Um, so main issues I find um, with processes is lack of record keeping. You need to record everything, even if it's on the production sheet, what happened that day, what went wrong that day, somebody did something wrong that day. So when you're checking your sample of cheese before it goes out, if there's anything wrong, you can backtrack to exactly what it was. I know so many people that don't take pH readings. The most important tools for a, a small, especially a small cheese maker, thermometer and a pH meter and know how to look after a pH meter. Calibrate it every day. Calibrate it maybe twice a day. Keep the bulb clean. Don't scrub the bowl with a harsh paper towel. It is just a glass bulb. There's lots of little holes in there that gives you hydrogen ion readings. So the pH meter is very, very important. Follow the manufacturing instructions. Um, keep it wet. Keep, keep it in the buffer solution or in um, potassium chloride. Um, incorrect cheese making processes, incorrect moisture, incorrect cultures. These are the little things that can happen. 
happens to everybody. So just knowing if it's happened, why has it happened, who's not following the procedure, who do we need to train? Little or too much salt. Salting is quite important and it is hard to know how long to salt for. So again, trial and error until you get it right. If you're changing size of a hoop and so your cheese is bigger or smaller, again, it's not exactly the same salting. So sometimes it is a bit of a guessing game. A lot to do with the ageing, incorrect maturing temperatures. And it's what I was saying before, that not one size fits all. So if you're making a blue and a wash rind and a white mould and trying to put them all in the same room, a blue cheese really only needs that warming room for a short time. Blue cheeses then get aged in less than five degrees. But I see people leaving blue cheeses in a warming room for months and months and months, sometimes at 12 degrees. Um, it's not really the right ageing for a blue cheese. Um, so, And again, just recognising if things are going wrong and acknowledging them and trying to address them. Again, when I look at pictures like this, and this is a cheese that was presented to me ages ago, you, know, you sort of look at this and go, is this okay to sell? And... I don't know what your thoughts are there, but for me, well, not really. It was purchased. And sometimes you really have to think about the process. So maybe what happened there now, it's hard to see on the picture, but it did have a funny smell. Um, it's got a bit of a, a pinky brown hue to it. Obviously, the cheese has just run away and that's what's left on the rind. So again, that could be so many different things. I'm just guessing here, but it could be like the pseudomonas producing some enzymes that's given a few off flavours. Um, milk maybe stored too long, milk that had travelled too far. Um, you have to sort of look after your milk. You don't want it being bashed around in, in a tanker for too long. So it could be a few issues. But I think, again, it comes back to being honest if you're the cheesemaker and recognising if there's issues and trying to solve them. I'm fortunate enough I, I can work in the teaching area and then I work at wholesale and I also work at retail. So I feel for a cheesemaker, when you see it come into distribution and we send it back because it's not right, or if a customer, when I'm at retail, brings it back to me the following week and said, I bought this last week, I'm very unhappy. So you can sort of see, I can see everybody's frustrations and it is very, very difficult. So it's hard from everybody's point of view. So it is hard from retailers right down to the cheesemakers. So again, it's just trying to make the best you can and again, recognising your issues or problems. All right, just a little bit about brining. Most concentrations of brine are saturated. So unless you're making a feta, um, so you most are saturated. So whether I'm brining a, um, a camembert or whether I'm putting in a papato, I keep separate brines from my mold ripened cheeses to my hard cheeses. If you're making up a new brine, you really should put in a little bit of um, calcium chloride. It just stops all the minerals leaching directly from your cheese into the brine when it's very, very fresh. My brine I use, because I'm small here and I've got the luxury of doing it, I change my brine every um, semester. So I try and keep it clean but I change it every semester, so at least twice a year or more, depending. But my hard cheese brine that lives out in the ageing room, I've had the same brine for about 15 years. I pasteurise it to keep it clean. I keep the top clean. I'm always scooping anything that's building up around the top. So it's very, very nutritious for the cheese. It doesn't leach anything out from it, but I only put in my hard Italian cheeses in there. I don't mix the cheeses. Again, pH adjust. So if you're starting off with a new brine, put some acid in and try and get it to about 5.2 to 5.6 should do it for most cheeses. Except for feta, we really would be getting it right down to 4.6 because feta really is quite an acidic cheese. And again, brining times really do uh, vary um, depending on the cheese. Okay, putting it all together, we're nearly there. So it is important to follow manufacturer's specifications running your cultures. If you've never looked at a spec sheet, just start asking for one every time you buy a culture and just have your little folder there because it's even good to write notes on there. Um, I've got notes written all over the place. So it's really good to have that. Look after your cultures and your rennet the best you can. Consider the environment and the equipment when adding a new variety of cheese. So a lot of people think, oh, I just might make this. And I think, well, you know, if you're going to make a cheddar, do you have a chipper? Do you have to chip by hand? If you're going to chip by hand, 
is the curd going to get cold? If the curd get cold, then it's hard to press. So you have all these other issues coming in. So really think about if you're going to add a new cheese. Uh, seasonality, winter milk has the most variation in milk components. You know, things change when you go from summer to winter, the feed changes, the grass has uh, got a lot more water in it, depends whether the cows are fed grain or on grass. Even the weather impacts on your ageing room and can you dry your cheeses out as much as you need to? And do you have the correct ageing rooms? I can't sort of stress that enough. And if you really do look at European cheeses, they make one cheese, you know, wash rind, companies make wash rind, nothing else. Parmesan, Parmigiano, Granite, all make, they make as Italian hard cheese. Your gorgonzola, they just make gorgonzolas. I totally get it in Australia, people saying, I need more variety to sell at the market. But I would say at least stick to the same style and just keep expanding the style. Um, for example, sort of all your fresh cheese companies, it's where the Italians got a little bit smart. They're making boccini 50 different ways. It's still stretched. It still comes out the same machine. They just change the shape. So that's where you sort of got to think if I'm sticking to the semi-hard range, the natural rinds, or if you're doing a natural rind and you don't have time to age it really well, maybe vacuum pack it for a while, then take the vacuum pack off and continue and build up a natural rind. So you can do little things like that to help if you're a very small producer and you don't have many employees. Uh, that should help. Um, and that's about it all. And we've got some references there that I used during the presentation. And now if there's any other questions. Now, I'm not sure what to do here. Okay. And Shay. Oh. And I got Thanks a Thanks so much, Gina. Oh, I'd like to stop sharing. Okay. Just. Okay. You got me now? I've got the chat. Yes. Okay. I've got some, somebody's asked me, is 18.8 stainless steel the best quality for vats? Oh, I don't know all the stainless steel, but I just know a marine grade 360, I think is what's always recommended, or at least marine grade. I'm not sure what the 18.8 mm -hmm. stainless means, <clears throat> but marine grade. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Gina. It's Carly Cannon. I just wanted to hey, say. Carly, how are you going? Good, how are you? I was, I was having trouble Thank getting you. my, Please. Um, my Please. sound to work earlier, but thank you so much. That was that was really brilliant. I'm glad I uh, I managed to uh, to get on and, and listen to that. It was um, yeah, really, really interesting and uh, and well presented, which I, I didn't expect anything less. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> I really greatly appreciate your feedback. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's great oh, good okay any right. other questions yeah. you any other thoughts i was wondering Carly, if you're still there for anyone else is there is there something that you think maybe i should have expanded on or you would like to expand mm -hmm. on because i've got kaylee that works with as well and she's got some ideas of moving forward jenny we might get kaylee doing a little presentation at some stage yes great gee um I guess it, it probably depends on the target audience um, in what they're kind of interested in. Um, I look, I think it was all it's all interesting going into all the cultures and that. Um, I don't know, maybe expanding on some of the uh, the terminologies and the and with pictures like you know when you're talking about your hooping or your different night, like maybe some of the the differences because. You know, that's a really valid point that all these different styles require quite, you know, very different. Um... Actually, that, that's good. And I suppose I could do something where we may just talk about soft ripened and what's best to use for soft ripened and then one different cheese, maybe. Yeah, and even just <laughs> even just some examples of the, the just how different it is, you know, mm -hmm. across the, um, the the different styles when you're talking about, you know, the the, the cutting and the you know, and all the rest of it. Okay. Yeah. A couple of people put up the cheesescience.org website. Yes, it's very, very good. I use it a lot. Um, or the uh, Cheese Science Toolkit. It's, it's excellent. So the more reading you do, the more investigating, um, I think really does help. And, again, encouraging to talk to other cheesemakers. 
it's a pity we didn't have some sort of a let's get together once a year and share our problems. But I think that's where I learn a lot and where I share my knowledge with. Yeah, I must say I'm actually totally in awe of especially small cheesemakers who take on all this work to create a business out of cheesemaking. There's so much science involved. There's so much in the way of knowledge required. So, um, Gina, just in terms of the courses that you conduct, how you've got two main courses, how long do they would, um, run for? And are they live in or do people find their own accommodation? Okay, so we run a certificate three in food processing because there's no real specific cheese making one. So I contextualise the cert three mm -hmm. and I run it in blocks. So it's around about once a month, three day blocks. And there's a lot of theory that we do on an online program called Learn. And so I've had a lot of interstaters and we've got on site um, accommodation. And so they come in for the, so it's always a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday when I run it. And I usually put like two units together that we have to do, but I, the cheese making, I, cover, I start off with food science. We do cheese science and then we do white mould, blue mould, non-bovine and cheddar. And then we do um, stock control and affinage. And so by the time they've done all the 17 units, they get a certificate three in food processing slash cheese. But in that time, they've made cheese. And we focus, when we focus on white mould, that's all we focus on. When we do blue, that's all we focus on. And we do tastings after every session. We also talk about problems. And if we find some, you know, cheeses that are amazing, we bring them along. So we show them the good and the bad. Great. Okay. okay, I, I think but, it's I'm happy to tailor any, say if we've got a company and they just want to send people along to do three days cheese making just specifically for their company or whatever. I can tailor around people. We just got to cost it out, that's all. Um, so I can tailor stuff. I've been talking to my manager about, you know, could I go out to factories? In South Australia, I can. I don't know if they'll let me go into states. But in SA, I do go out to factories and we uh, deliver um, like a traineeship. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so I've put a link there that um, Pete, if you can um, copy that and um, provide yep. feedback on Gina's webinar today, that would be really good. If people have further questions, you can email Gina or um, myself and I'll pass them on to Gina and she can get back to you and answer your questions. But also importantly, if you have more ideas for future webinars in the line of this, we would really appreciate your input. Yeah, thank you, Miriam. Okay, um, Sharon's asked a question here about the courses. So Jen, Jenny, it might be best if Sharon, if you just get my email address of Jenny and email me and I can talk to you how I do the online things and how I've worked, I've got, quite a few people from Queensland doing um, the course. So could you just maybe, it'd be easy if I just communicate directly with Sharon? Yep, not a problem. We can work that okay. one out. Yep. yep, not a problem. Okay, so I think okay. that's all then for today. If anybody has Thank further you. questions, as I said, you're welcome to send them through to Gina or send them to me and I'll pass them on. So with that, we'll close the webinar for today. Thank you very much, Gina, for all the time and effort you've put into this. Um, Thank it's you. been fantastic and there's, a, you know, obviously a, a really big need for it. So thanks Thank very you. much. Okay. Thank you.